Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Tuesday, August 29th. Derek Van Riper here with Chris Welsh. Eno Saris trying to troubleshoot his internet. So all the best to Eno as he tries to uh, deal with modern technology in a way that probably is overwhelming, to be completely honest. But lots of ground for us to cover today. We got a promotion in Boston. We got Kyle Harrison pitching really, really well in his second big league start. And then we're going to focus on some players who have use their prospect eligibility over the course of 2023 that we actually like going into 2024. Also a couple mailbag questions, time permitting, but let's begin with that promotion in Boston. Sedan Rafaela up now for the Red Sox. Expectations here, I think are pretty clear for me, Welsh. I think it's just steady playing time. He is a great defensive center fielder. This is a team that needs a center fielder. I think the bigger questions are all focused on what you get out of the box from Sedan Rafaela at the plate. So looking at what he has done and having watched him a bit on video, what do you see Rafaela bring to the table initially as he tries to make adjustments against big league pitching for the first time? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things is going to be the ability to be a five-tool player out there to compete for power. He's going to be able to run. He made an interesting adjustment and I would love to know like the the full on logic behind what it was, but in double A this year, you know, he dominated two ninety four, stole thirty bases in sixty games. So every other game he's stealing a base. He only had six homers, which was fine. And he just it, it was very reminiscent of um maybe like a number two hitter. You'd love a guy to walk a little bit more if you're leading off. But then he comes up to triple A and it just kind of flipped and he started hitting for even more power. So in less games than double A, he more than doubled his home run rate, had 14 homers in 48 games, and then only stole six bases. Strikeout percentage stayed the same. Batting average went up. And one of the biggest changes you saw was a lowered ground ball rate. So he was definitely getting the ball in the air more, which is obviously gonna be representative of more power. Just makes really good contact. And, you know, I saw, I've been thinking about this and I'm trying to remember who it was. I saw somebody make this comp of like a Rafaela to Michael Harris type of comp uh, the other day. And I, and I was kind of sitting on that like, oh, that's interesting because I think there's something to that. Um, I'm not sure if everybody was really bought into the power potential that was going to be there with Harris. And and to be fair, I think Rafaela has shown it off, you know, 20, 20 homers in the minor so far. He almost had a 20, he just fell short of a 20, 40 season in the minor leagues, but he even stopped pulling the ball as much in AAA. So it's kind of a weird AAA profile overall. But I think he's got a phenomenal approach. I think he's going to make a ton of contact. I don't know where the power numbers are going to be. I, I, I tend to kind of think the power numbers are going to maybe come backwards a little bit. But if Boston's going to let him steal, I think he's going to be able to push for five outfielder 12-team leagues. He's someone I'm speculating on. Um, you know, we've had a couple of these guys like, you know, Parker Meadows has come up and has been decent, but Rafaela to me is a player that he can probably push three tools to four tools. If the homers get there, he can score runs. I don't think he's going to hit high in the lineup, but I think the batting average is going to be there. And we already, you know, saw him get to have a, uh, an at bat. And, uh, I think it was yesterday and he's going to be starting today as we're recording this. So if Rafaela gets regular playing time, he's going to be valuable the rest of this year. And I think this is actually probably one of the better case scenarios for outfielders with Pereira up, Pete Crow Armstrong just kind of sitting. We don't know <laughs> where the what's going to go on with that. I actually think this is one of the better case scenarios of a player we could get at this stretch if you want to make a prospect eligible run here. Uh, because I just like what he does. I like the uh, the lower ground ball rates. I like him getting the ball in the air. And I'm hopeful that... You know, 25% line drive rate is going to push doubles in so far this year, and he's going to be able to really contribute for fantasy for, you know, the next, whatever it is, four weeks. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways this can go right. I am curious to see how the hit tool holds up against top-level pitching. I think we've yeah. wondered on this show throughout the season, you know, what's the overall quality of pitching, maybe at AA and AAA. AAA in particular has been getting picked on for the last couple of years thanks to a lot of pitching injuries at the big league level. Some of the guys that would be stuck at AAA are in the big league, so there's a bit of a gap. Um, the quality of the pitching at that level constantly being questioned. But yeah, you, you talk about a guy that fits a roster really well, too. I think that's where Rafaela kind of pops for me. It's just that clear path to what should be a near everyday role uh, the rest of the way. So I'm with you on the, the 12 team, five outfielder sort of uh, appeal. You know, he's probably a top 75 player at the position. 
upon arrival because of the ways he can help even would with you, some possible downside. Would you rather Rafaela or Parker Meadows right now? <sighs> That's tough. Uh, Meadows... In some ways, Meadows feels like a slightly more finished product to me. Like, so I think that's probably that's probably a case where I would want. I'd probably want Parker Meadows. You know, being a year older, having seen it a little bit longer in the upper levels. But I think if you're playing long term keeper in Dynasty. I think Rafaela maybe brings that extra upside I'd be looking for. So I'm split if it's redraft versus a keeper situation. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I mean, Parker Meadows so far in his seven games, he's got a homer, he's got a stolen base. He's hitting for fine average, but he's striking out a lot. 35% strikeout rate. He walks. So, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's an extreme outcome uh, at bat every single time. Like something's happening, you know, he's striking out, he's getting on base, not a lot of ground out type of things. You're getting extreme outcomes. I tend to think Rafaela would be more impactful <clears throat> in most scenarios. Just with this though, I kind of wonder, are you going to continuously hit him lower? Meadows can maybe just peak himself up a little bit more. They have, I think, probably more of an incentive to play Meadows every single day than mess around with roster stuff like Boston would that Rafaela might not get every single day starts where Meadows, I think, really could. So I, I think maybe by a hair, I might go with Meadows as well. But I, would, I wouldn't want both, but I would try to make it work with Rafael. Or if I missed on Meadows, I would definitely try to make it work with Rafaela. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it, too. Meadows getting scooped up in a lot of leagues this past weekend. Rafaela probably going to be one of the bigger pickups and will likely come back up on the Friday rundown this week as well. Let's talk about a pitching performance from a rookie that we thought we'd see earlier in the season, but performance up to this point was not what we really expected. I'm going to say Kyle Harrison has taken a one nothing lead against my analysis so far. <laughs> I was really concerned about the way they were cutting his starts very short in triple a and maybe i got pcl'd you know i tweeted this earlier today i don't think you're ever too old to get pcl'd the league is awful to pitch in it's wreaking havoc of course on offensive numbers it always has so you factor in automated balls and strikes and other variables that have made triple a more of a nightmare this year you begin to to think you can't really trust much of anything that's happening at the AAA level, that's probably a step or two too far. But Kyle Harrison went six and a third scoreless innings, 11 Ks, all of that season highs, of course, just three hits allowed uh, in his start on Monday night. I mean, he went five innings one time at AAA in 20 yeah. starts with Sacramento. So what's happening here? Is this some of the stuff that Eno has brought to the table where – the game planning at the big league level is just better, right? Throwing to Patrick Bailey, who's become in short order, one of the best defensive catchers league wide, even though he himself is a rookie. Like, is it just some of those things? And, and Harrison, maybe always having good stuff. The K's have been there all along. My, my reservations about Harrison and redraft leagues were not a, a long-term, this guy's never going to be a viable fantasy starter take. I'm, I'm not there either. But I'm surprised to see his best start of the season come in late August at the big league level in start number two, no less. Yeah, it would be beneficial if Eno was here for this one specifically, too, because of his obvious connection with the Giants. And But, you know, let me I'll add a couple things here with what you were saying. First off, I don't think the worry with Harrison is like unwarranted. Like, I don't like when you say like you got PCL, like maybe a part of it, but. He was a little bit of a different situation. I mean, his first outing of the year, he couldn't get through a full inning, got blown up. He didn't hit five innings until June 15th, and that was the only time he ever pitched five innings in the minors. While on top of it, he was walking, guys. His first five starts, he never walked less than two batters. And again, he was only going like three innings. He had three of those five starts with four walks. So his command seemed to be all over the place. Yes, there's the pcl'd element of you know elevation screwing with some results and i think over time it kind of tapered back down a little bit but my worry early on was the stuff what just wasn't there it wasn't about oh man you know he's the velos are great and the command is looking okay but he's getting hit and stuff it was like no he can't go deep he doesn't seem to be hitting any of his spots against you know triple a talent that had much bigger concerns on how that was going to readjust but then you get to what's going on now. Yeah, I wonder if it is a, you know, Giants 
major leagues, they know the better way to approach the the pitcher. Or if this also was just part of the game plan, because, you know, him only going three or four innings the whole season could have been built up for him to be able to get real major league innings. I mean, it's a little counterintuitive because you would hope you when you get a guy and you want him to go five or six, you'd hope he had gone, you know, like five or six a couple times in triple A. That wasn't happening. So I think probably the safest thing to assume is the major league adjustments. But we've also seen this with pitchers before. I, I immediately thought of like Michael Kopech. Now that's not a good story now, but Michael Kopech was such a disaster. Those like those two years before he came up, I remember seeing him in like spring tra- spring camps and he was like throwing side sessions and trying to get secondaries to go and felt like the fastball Vila was coming back just a tiny bit. He had nothing on a changeup, nothing on breaking pitches. Results weren't there. And I think a lot of people were just kind of ready to maybe call it off. And then you get to the majors and it was like his first start all of a sudden, if I'm remembering correctly, it was like, I think he was throwing like a slider and it was like a bunch and we were like, whoa, what's happening? And he's getting strikeouts and he just he, off speed. He looked, he wasn't just throwing a fastball 70% of the time he was doing pitching and it was something we really hadn't seen. And this was a little reminiscent of that, though this was just like more of his stuff. His stuff was on display. He almost threw fastball 70% of the time in this last start where he had 11 Ks. He got 12 swing and whiffs, seven on the fastball. That's something that I felt like we would see. We used to see in, um, you know, like Brandon Fott did that like in AAA, but we didn't see it at the major league level. His slurve. He ended up having a 50% swing and whiff rate, and he had a 41 CSW, but a lot of it was about doing something that um, that we hadn't seen him do a lot, DVR, was he was commanding his pitches. He was mm-hmm. commanding the zone, and that's probably, if you want to pinpoint what is the thing that the major league guys did, is they probably found something to simplify to make sure he's throwing strikes or give him confidence to throw strikes because that is a sexy fastball it is a power fastball that does beautiful things and all you hope is he's got a couple secondaries where he can live off of that and you know he he hit 96 on it it was moving he was getting his strikes and he was commanding and that's just what we hadn't been seeing in the minor leagues so that's kind of the big uh, differential so i'm not so sure it is pcl'd so much in that it's uh, a combo of this developmental process for him to do something Literally, we hadn't like there's no reason to be like, oh, I take the L like we don't see him go five. He went five once the entire year. It was complete efficiency at the major league level with great stuff. And another reason to maybe prop up, you know, stuff plus on a long term level to talk about, you know, it's like with hitters, like great tools can end up, you know, having those great results once fully harnessed. The same thing with great stuff. Plus, once fully harnessed, you get 11 K's and, you know, in, in these outings. And we saw some improvements with the, with the control even before he got promoted, at least in terms of the, the walk totals and some of those final appearances at AAA for Kyle Harrison. All right, let's move on to some of the prospects from this season who have graduated from prospect status and may present really intriguing value targets for 2024. And this might be relevant, too, if you're playing in a keeper or a dynasty league where trading never stops. Get some trade deadlines coming up here at the end of this week in a few leagues that I play in. Number one on my list, Welsh, was someone that I really liked going into 2023, and this season has not gone well whatsoever. It's Miguel Vargas. I think everything that went wrong for Miguel Vargas traces right back to the thumb injury that he was dealing with in spring training. He was playing in spring training games basically with the directive, do not swing the bat, which, you know, for him, he's got a good eye at the plate. He drew some walks during that span, but I just think that's the kind of injury that without a prolonged shutdown period, it's so easy to aggravate it multiple times over the course of the year. I guess the bigger question is, do you see the Dodgers still wanting to prioritize Vargas as an everyday player? This is a more complicated depth chart than most, especially knowing they could trade, they could spend a lot of money this offseason. Uh, but from a talent perspective, I'm in. It's just more of the question of how he fits into their 2024 plans. Yeah, I think prioritize. I my read on it would be, Prioritizing is they probably want to give him every opportunity to take back a job. Um, they made the proper moves to solidify they don't need anybody 
you know, that's what they ended up doing. You get uh, Ricky Hernandez and they bring in to bring up Michael Bush finally after what felt like 3000 years. I remember last week I literally was like, they'll never bring him up. And they had literally brought him up the minute I had said that, which was weird. But I have to assume the weird thing I've noticed is like, no matter what, whether it's been major league or minors, I don't feel like anything has changed with him this year. Like I don't see any substantial change in the minor league so far as he's been in AAA. Strikeouts are just like a tiny bit up. He's putting up some of those counting stats that we expected, but it's very similar to years past. Just everything looks about the same. So I would assume, you know, this guy who has a really good hit tool, he can get on base, flexibility positionally, it's kind of a washed year that they're going to give him every opportunity. And that's the only thing I'm worried about is I just don't think it's going to be handed like it was this year that I think there's going to be more competition put to it. And it's like, yes, you have the opportunity to earn this job back and it's going to be what steps have uh, been taken. I don't think there's really any quantifiable stuff we can look at. I mean, if someone had really great minor league data that might help, but you know, Rotowire's, um, Rotowire's hard hit batter ball data, it's pretty low hard hit numbers again, you know, 26%. The Ks, like I said, went up a little bit. There was just nothing that was really worked on. So what that also tells me, by the way, is my agreement with you, is when you don't see anything like, hey, they're having him pull the ball more, they're having him, whatever it is, you know, take more pitches or take less pitches, be more hype. Maybe he's being more hyper aggressive because the strikeouts are up. That does kind of tell me that that, uh, that finger injury really did play a big toll in him just being backtracked the whole year, even off of recovery of it. It may have just stunted him from doing certain things. So he's going to get an opportunity back. This is one that like, it's like the, the data driven things out there, you know, like the data driven listen stuff. There's nothing to tell you any huge positive buy from Miguel Vargas. So to me, this would be like, this is prior knowledge of knowing like the impact type of hitter he can be. He steals. He, I mean, he's for all intents and purposes, a five tool player who qualifies at third base and can play other spots that you have to go on prior track record to being comfortable buying in on him. And I think I would, cause I think they'll give him an opportunity. And if he returns to form, then I think he's going to get back to it. I just would have loved to see something you could really put your finger on, you know, pun intended, uh, in this minor league stint of like, hey, he's now going in and he's pulling the ball way more than he's ever done. It's more than last year, and it's more than the majors this year, but it's not something I'm sure is a thing that we can go and read and be like, oh, yeah, this is changing. He's got a higher ground ball rate uh, than he has since 2019 as well. So I think this has been a reacclimation year. And by those standards, that's someone I would I would probably still buy on in the offseason. Yeah, you look at some of the rest of season projections as slash lines that might give us a guide to what the 2024 projections are going to point to. The bat X is the most optimistic about Vargas with a 264, 329, 455 line. And that would be really nice if he could even do that. Obviously, the results we saw between high A, double A, and triple A in 2021 and 2022 were 300 hitter flirting with a 400 OBP at times with power and with some speed kind of on a 2020 pace last year at AAA would have exceeded that I think with a full season's worth of games at that level and that's sort of what he's done in the brief time back down there even though the the batted ball types and the distribution of where he's hitting the ball hasn't changed a whole lot five homers six steals and 38 games I would still like that this package is a lot that can go right. He has lost eligibility in some formats, might be second base only entering 2024. So that could knock his value down a little bit more because people won't be looking at him as one of those uh, draft and hold glue guys yeah. that can cover three or four spots. I'm glad you brought up the stats because that's the only thing like I'm sitting here talking about, like you have to kind of go back to who he was and just wash your, you know, your mind of what this season has been. If you are of the belief that this is kind of just a, missed last season due to that injury, which you are. And I think I kind of am. And I didn't give the stats and that's exactly who he is. He's like a 2020 base player with a high batting average. He's a high, he's got a f over 400 OBP right now in the minors as well while he's hitting 280. So this is a great OBP guy in OBP leagues. I'd be picking him up, but if you're comfortable with that, those are the stat lines of who he was, of who he was prior. This is a close to probably over 160 games, a 20 home run hitter, Looks like he could be a 20 steal guy. Scored 100 runs in 2022 in AAA. So 
I'm definitely still like looking at that player and hoping there's not a big regression standpoint. But you know what, dude? Like, I think of also Royce Lewis. Royce Lewis, when you know he came to the fall league, and it was the dumbest question I've ever. I actually apologized to him for doing it. I I asked him. I was like, so you know, what do you think about this bad year? It was something like that. I was just like, Oops. you know, and, and he and he was like bad year like he didn't register it as a bad year and it came from him being like well you know i hurt my wrist i think it was a wrist and then he's like that set me back all of spring training and then like i he's like i spent the first two months of the minor leagues essentially being like my spring training and i never got my feet under me and he was awful and people were writing him off then he came to the fall league and he hit 360 or whatever and i think he won the MVP or I I don't even remember if he won the MVP, but he was in that kind of running and look at him now. I mean, you went back onto that talent and he's kind of moved past injury. Miguel Vargas had an injury. That's the only real thing that I think we can take away from like the talent of what this player is. So I guess I have some of that. It can't be one for one, but sometimes I have that prior history of that exact Royce Lewis situation of us needing to understand that sometimes like a simple injury, especially in this developmental ish time, can really just set a guy back and it can set them back for an entire season. And I kind of feel like maybe the Dodgers recognize that as well, because none of the things they did seem like long-term options that are going to stunt Miguel Vargas from giving him another shot in the moves they made. They just made short-term stuff. So I don't know you put that all together. It might kind of speak to Miguel Vargas still being a buy, but maybe the top, top high end value should be chopped off a little bit. Right. Instead of expecting more 2020 type production, maybe it's 15, 15, but I think there's still a lot of ways for it to go right for Miguel Vargas. Yeah. Uh, interesting. I got Vargas and Brett Beatty on a keeper league team and I'm here. I am trying to pump them up as, as good by lows, not because I'm getting rid of them in those leagues. <laughs> I'm holding both players in that particular league. Brett Beatty having a great run at AAA after a disappointing run with the Mets this season. We saw the defensive shortcomings. We saw the ground ball rate was a bit high for a guy that you want to see tap into that power consistently. Since being demoted to AAA, he is pounding the ball. 10 homers in 24 games. He's lowered that ground ball rate. He's kept the K rate nice and tidy at 20%, drawing walks like he did at most of his minor league stops. Uh, I think the thing that I'm clinging to for Brett Beatty, it's actually two things. Organizationally, they seem like they're taking a little more of a long view approach. So I could see them being very patient with him in 2024, trying to see if he's a a key core player for them going forward. And then from a performance perspective, I love to see nice hard hit rates, even when the ground ball rate might be high. We've talked about this before. Like, how do you look for future power? I just want guys that come up to the big leagues and hit the ball hard right away. A 43.9% hard hit rate in the 86 games that Brett Beatty played at the big league level this year. To me, there's some underlying positives, even though a lot went wrong for him at the big league level in his first go round. Yeah, the, and the Rotowire uh, hard hit data, 48.6 in around a little over 100 plate appearances. And for reference on that batted ball data, you get to like 30 and it's like green and they color code mm-hmm. it, which is nice green. 35% is like a dark green. This is like, this is testing the boundaries of how dark you can go with green when you get into 48%. But hard, this has always been his specialty too. He's been doing this for years and years. This guy's like a 110 hard hit machine and it's just about consistently doing it. So like to your point, what is he doing in AAA? We were, I don't, I don't think we're gonna talk about this guy, but we were actually talking off air about Matt Mervis mm-hmm. and you know, he was the data darling for for many. I, I liked him. Then you see him in the Arizona Fall League, and then you could see some shortcomings of seeing him play every day, but you would still see like big, you know, hard hit numbers. But there were some deficiencies that were out there. But the whole point of it was what we've been looking at for this year. The expectation is like, well, if that guy is going to be elite, he should probably like dominate in AAA right now, especially if you look at the the numbers, which was like high walk, the K numbers for a big power guy were starting to come down. He hit for, you know, what, what was it last year? It was like he walked better at every single level. He hit a, had a b- higher batting average at every single level. He dropped his Ks at every single level. You expect him, that type of hitter, to be hitting like 350, 360. So what I'm bringing that back to is like, you would expect Brett Beatty, especially if he's going to be a really good player and there's just a thing or two, you would expect him to be good. But I think you could maybe 
toe the line of like he has been a couple steps even above good because not only has he hit over 300, which is phenomenal. He did hit 364 in 2022, but he's over 300. His walk rate is the essentially highest of his high A or higher career. He had like a very short stint in low A, like four games where he had like a 35%, but 14.5% this year walk rate. And he's also lowered his K percentage to what is the lowest of any time he has played more than... 10 games at a single level it is the uh, well actually now that i say that major leagues in uh, 2022 he had a 19 percent in 11 games so any oh, 12 games or above it's the lowest k percentage one of the highest walk percentage it's the highest iso he's at it at any single level this year and you also see that um the fly ball rate ended up let me go and take a look here it ended up uh, going up to 33%, which is the highest tied tied for the highest he's ever had. Ground ball rate dropped 10% from where it was last year, but the pull rate didn't go with it. So he's just making better decisions to spray the ball around the field with big hard hit numbers. He's the type of guy that will tap into power when he makes contact. So that's one instance where it's like, oh, I don't care if he's pulling the ball as much because when he makes contact, there's going to be big results. So all of this is the easy way to say like, you're right. They've kind of really babied him, let him get his feet under. I think he's made all the changes you could possibly ask for in the minors. So when given the opportunity next year, because there's some, you see those rumors about like the Mets are going to trade Pete Alonso, almost affirmative in the off season. Who's going to be the benefit beneficiary? Yeah. Yeah. To your brewers. <laughs> it's going to be Brett Beatty. And I think that this team is also planning on knowing what they have behind the scenes, whether it's at third or first, more opportunity is going to go up. And I think everything that Beatty is doing signals to me as a buy, maybe even more so than Miguel Vargas. Like Miguel Vargas hasn't done anything, but it's the injury. Brett Beatty, I think, is continuously showing improvement. And he's the type of guy that has like impact, impact. Like he's a 30 plus home run, 100, 100 type of run RBI guy. Where Miguel Vargas, if we're reevaluating, he might be more. You know, like we said, like 20 or 15, 15, if he's sitting at the top of the order, I think that makes him a little bit more valuable. But if he's hitting like seven for a whole year, he's just going to be capped or Brett Beatty is just to me is not one of those. So I, I do think he's even more of a buy than uh, than, you know, previously stated. Yeah, I think that's a great point on Vargas is where he fits in that Dodgers lineup could work against his value a little bit, even if he does have that everyday role. Beatty, you could see more easily fitting into the heart of that Mets order, especially if the polar bear to Milwaukee dream comes true. It was weird before there was that Ken Rosenthal column that mentioned that those teams were talking. I was just thinking about that post deadline as something that would have made a lot of sense because the Brewers desperately need power. Alonzo seems like a great fit in Wisconsin. Seems like a guy that would pop up in Green Bay in November and get shown on the Jumbotron, just double fisting two beers mm. and just chugging both of them. And the crowd just goes absolutely wild just seems like going, great... to going to packer games without shirt on that type of yep. stuff in December. oh yeah. Yep. yeah yeah you'd see him at bucks games that you'd see him all over the place in here i, I mean, mean maybe maybe not he, i don't know well it's funny too because he's like a florida guy uh he definitely like fits the mold but that would have been a big trade i you know Huge. probably i assume it would have been around like a guy like corbin burns who that that is all nasty and stuff like that i don't know if it's prospect based or major league based or whatever but you know he goes to milwaukee that's a whole nother conversation of value and if the mets are really you know if the mets are really committed which i still don't believe a part of me but if they're really committed to like we're retooling and we're getting all these then they're going to try to go get a haul and the brewers still have guys you know and it might be the jacob miserowski's would have to be involved in a trade like that and um you know they got a couple other really good lower level players that would be probably part of what the mets would be doing to retool but that's that would be fascinating either way it opens up that opportunity for brett Beatty to if you take off like studs on that lineup Beatty probably not going to hit lower than five next year if he's given that opportunity so yeah the more we talk about it really think he's such like a great buy who's not doing anything right now if you do have a deadline that's still sitting out there or a you know, it opens up early ish into the off season. Beatty's a guy I'll probably be drafting in like some of those early, you know, NFBC best balls that are going to happen in November. I'll probably have quite a few shares of him. You mentioned Mervis in passing. And I think Mervis versus Jonathan Aranda is kind of an interesting toss up. Um, I, I look at them as somewhat similar players. I think 
Aranda's consistent low K rates throughout his time in the minors could probably give him the edge. It looks like there's less swing and miss in that profile. Major concerns about where Jonathan Ronda plays defensively, but if you were yeah. betting on one of those guys to break through and have a large role for 2024, is it Mervis or is it Aranda? Oh, man. See, see, like, I've seen a lot of Mervis, and I, I know what the shortcomings are, but I also have seen that upside. Like, and the upside is light tower power. I mean, that guy, I was telling you off air that one of those homers I have, you can check my Twitter it was like he hit it from his shoe, you know, his socks, and he just absolutely golfed and launched this ball, which for a lot of people would have looked like a fly ball, but it is just raw, raw power. I don't know. I guess the difference I've I've assumed with Aranda is like he has hit for average for so long that I assume he's going to be a high batting average with really beautiful home run numbers in the minors. Neither one of these guys steal. I guess I would go with Aranda, but I feel like his playing time might be more in question than Mervis's. Like, why have the Cubs just not given that run to Mervis at this point? I don't know. It might speak that might what's not happening might be louder uh, than anything else. But at the same time, though, I do feel like this team could just let and give him a go where I just don't trust that with the Rays at any point. So I think Aranda's maybe a little bit of a safer bet, but I think Mervis has a a better opportunity to be given the job for however long that's going to be than Aranda does. They just don't hand the Rays. How often do they hand anything over to guys? You know, it's the, it's a short list of guys that come up and just take an everyday Franco. Role. That was yeah. it. Like who else besides Franco was like really immediately given that spot. I think a Rosarena kind of, but he kind of had to work for it. And then he just never let it go. He was older Nobody too. Else. Who? Rosarena was older too, so it, it wasn't it wasn't like from prospect, young prospect to playing all the time. And that's what makes me wonder. Like, yeah. Junior Caminero is probably the next guy that they're going to do that with. Yeah, You're already exactly. seeing it. Like Curtis Mead, they, they've kind of been up and down with him. Aranda's been up and down. It's Mead hit like 290, and then they're just like, see ya. You know, yeah. they, then they sent him down. That's that's my point. Is like I don't know when that changes. I don't know what the level, what it is that they need to find that makes them comfortable. If it's guys that force their hands, but I, I, I guess you could say that me didn't force their hand, but he played pretty well. He pre played pretty well, and Aranda has. Vi I mean, it's like video game type of stuff. When you look, twenty five homers this year in AAA while hitting three thirty nine, eighty run, eighty RBI. It's stupid. So you would expect that you would just be given a run, especially with some of the shortcomings as of late with the roster construction, but they don't. They just don't. So I think Aranda's the talent, but Mervis might be given the runway to make something happen. I guess it just then it just becomes a question, do you believe that's ever gonna happen? And I don't know. You know, I know I know you talked to you do the show with Keith uh, Keith Law, and I'm not sure if Keith thinks that would happen with Matt Mervis. You know, there when you watch Matt Mervis in person versus the numbers that are on the the sheet they're a little bit different they're a little <laughs> bit different and you're kind of waiting for them to align and i think that's where you know real 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 baseball for baseball evaluation versus fantasy uh, would kind of clash a little bit yeah i think the the key for the rays if you're going to open up a spot to make it easier for jonathan aranda and or curtis mead to play a lot more Brandon Lau seems like a guy that has to find yeah. his way to another roster. I think he has that kind of team-friendly extension where he's cost-controlled for a while, but you trade him, that opens up a spot in the infield, and that changes the look of things trade quite a bit. Trade for some pitching. They could use for some, you know, they're just going to keep stacking up Tommy John guys. You trade for some pitching. But the only problem is, is that I don't think that opens up for Aranda. That opens up for Meade. Aranda, mm -hmm. do they trust Aranda at second base? That's probably a Meade job. Third base, what happens? That's a Caminero job. So I still wonder, like, where, what, what would they do? Would they just a you know, full time DH with some, you know, first base for Aranda? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they'll trade Aranda to a team that has a pitcher that's been bad for two or three years in the big leagues, and they'll just turn that pitcher into a stud. And that team will at least give Aranda the playing time, and we'll find out why the Rays haven't given him the playing time prior to now. I feel like the Rays and like the White Sox, like put, like get Dylan Cease over with the Rays, and you know maybe you could trade like Aranda, and then maybe they do, maybe they would trade one of those pitching prospects. You know they probably, 
I could see where they couldn't afford it, but maybe you trade like a Boz. You know, it's like a Boz mm-hmm. and an Aranda to go to the White Sox. White Sox can do part of their rebuild, and then the White Sox and then the Rays get like major league ready talent. Just something to throw out. Yeah, I'd be really curious to see what those two teams did if they hooked up for a deal. Uh, one more bat that kind of jumped off the page for me from the rookie class that people are probably not that high on, but I think they should be, Henry Davis. I mean, we saw Henry Davis come up uh, not really catching, so that's the that's the twist, right? He's made two appearances behind the plate, so likely to lose catcher eligibility in most leagues. He's been hurt a little bit, but much like we talked about, I think, with Brett Beatty, it's the hard hit rate that gets you interested, right? A 43.4% hard hit rate. We've seen a little bit of in-game power, five homers in 51 games. He's stolen a handful of bases. I don't know how much that's going to be a part of his game, but he ran a little bit coming through the Pirates system and clearly moving from catcher to outfield has enough athleticism to do a little something on the base pass, but you're drafting him for power. You're drafting him as a guy that has controlled the strike zone really well and I think has realistic 30 home run potential with time i don't know if it's coming in 2024 but i think the other part of the appeal is when i think about what the pirates look like next year henry davis is somewhere in the heart of that order so you have this higher ceiling for great counting stats because of the way they're likely to use him yeah see that's a really good point is he's definitely locked into something the only problem is is not only you know has the batting average struggled but like you know, we there's some K worries that are in there, some strikeout worries for him in general. Um, I'm a little indifferent on Henry Davis because I, one of the things is I thought he was going to be a catcher. <laughs> I thought he was 100% going to be a catcher. Seeing him in the minors, watching him in the AFL, I, I watched him at Louisville. And you mentioned the stolen bases. He's been stealing since college. You know, So that is something that is definitely a part of his game. But I think it's more a handful. Like this is the type of guy that I, at peak – I think you could see 10 stolen bases. I do think I agree with you. There's a 30 home run potential in there. I just don't know where the quality of contact is going to be. And that's the thing that I kind of can't get over with him is how awesome is that quality of contact going to be? XBA is higher. That's good. It's closer to 240. You're essentially at 110 maxi for plus power. I like that launch angle barrel percentage. It's getting like everything is just kind of getting there with him. So I think you can play like a, with time and with maturation, he can be a solid player. But if we're also comparing him against, like, let's say Miguel Vargas and Brett Beatty, he's at the bottom. Hmm. Aranda versus Henry Davis is interesting because I think we go right back to that Mervis thing. Like, Henry Davis, I think, is way more guaranteed than Aranda still is. But I think Aranda's talent is, like, quite a bit higher. So I would probably put Henry Davis at the bottom of this, though I would relent on having him just above Aranda if you feel like he's just never going to get a spot. But I think there's been good strides, but we also just saw just wamp down on the consistency as far as like, you know, him being able to hit for high average. So I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm out on Henry Davis because even in a bad year, he's probably a 20 homer close to 10 stolen base guy, but uh, he's the least interested I am of buying back into prospects that have lost eligibility for next year. So we're going to save pitching for a future week. That makes sense to have Eno here for that. That is yeah. absolutely his wheelhouse. Uh, I wanted to answer a couple of mailbag questions that fit into this conversation. We had a question about Estevan Florial from John. Uh, John is in an AL only keeper league and thought one of his best picks this year was Florial really late. And he's still stuck in Scranton. There are tools here. Like there's power, there's speed. The big question for Estevan Florial, as you can see, if you look at his Fangraphs page, it's the hit tool, right? You see it reflected in the high K rate. It's a, according to Fangraphs, 30 grade hit tool with a future 30. That's not usually mm. something you see on an everyday big league player. But when you have 60 raw power, 70 speed, you're doing a lot of things that we as fantasy players really like. And you know, given that this has turned into such a disappointing season for the Yankees and thinking about some of the veterans, guys like Jake Bowers that have been able to collect a, a significant amount of playing time over the course of the year, I am surprised they haven't given Florial a look. He's 25 already. He's going to turn 26 in November. So if they're not playing him now, I almost think his best opportunity is going to be on a different roster. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen for him in New York. Oh, I I don't even think that's a question. I mean, you're surprised. I'm not surprised because I think the answer is right there. It's because they don't see him as a part of the future. He, I mean, he has organizational depth. If they didn't have options, I think they probably would have. But what has Florio really changed in his profile? He hit more homers, most homers he's ever hit this year. That's great. It's a 270 ISO. 
but he's still striking out the same level. He is, it's like right at 30%. He walks a little bit more, he hits more homers, but you also probably should when you've played at AAA for two years or three years. This is his third year in AAA and not just like a little bit. 78 games, 101 games, 89 games. He has, I mean, that's roughly almost 300 games at AAA. You would expect with a guy who is immensely talented, because I, I got to see him multiple times in the AFL, and he is like crazy physical athlete. He can fly across the bases. He hit the one of the easiest triples I've ever seen. I was actually going through like old AFL video not too long ago, and I found that triple, and he just flies across the bases. He can absolutely hit for huge power. There was a time, if people don't remember, Luis Robert was in the AFL at the same time, and Florial was seen as a better prospect over Luis Robert in that same period of time because they actually had similar skill sets. But Florial never got past being the strikeout issues, which is a bigger conversation around his ability to hit anything that's not a fastball. And he can't put himself in good counts, and he just continuously gets beat. And I don't think that has ever changed. Did he adjust to hit for more power? Yes. Did he have a better ISO? Yes. Is the batting average up? Yes. But this team clearly had better options. They have got Oswald Cabrera. They brought up Everson Pereira, who is a part of their future. Jason Dominguez, you could argue, could be up now. He's Jason Dominguez is having a wildly great second half to the year. And for a guy that was hitting 220 in like May, he's up to almost 270 with game-changing stolen bases, making great decisions, hard hit numbers. It's just there's nothing worthwhile, I think, for this team to even look at him when he's still exhibiting these same issues. So back to your point, he's going to do this with another team if he's ever going to do it. You just pray, and this is you and I were talking about this off air. You just pray he can find a team that has one of these elusive, great uh, hitting departments that can change. You know, jo I was mentioning Josh Rojas is praising the Mariners right now for the changes they're making in his game. This is coming off of a Diamondbacks team that was one of the best offensive teams in baseball, especially early on, but there was nothing happening. I don't know what they were doing with him. He lost his ability to hit for power, and then Rojas lost his confidence. The Mariners did something to retap into the power and get his confidence back, and he started praising their hitting coach. That's what you need for Floreal. You need somebody that can like take it and make whatever that adjustment is. You need a Braves team. You need a Giants team. You need a Mariners team. You need one of those that can take this crazy athlete who is 2020. If he could ever recoup what he does in AAA to the majors, it's top five round fantasy talent for sure. But it doesn't translate. And that is more probably about the pitch recognition and how he gets himself into counts and can hit like off speed stuff. So you need a coach that can make an adjustment for him, and then he becomes worthwhile. So I would be paying attention to where he goes in the offseason because no doubt it's not a Yankees team that I assume he's going to be with. Yeah, they have kept him at AAA for the better part of three seasons now. So yeah. um, no longer with minor league options. So I think that's the other thing that could steer him out of town. It reminds me, the way you were describing Floreal with tools, it's similar to Jorge Mateo. And Jorge Mateo had the same kinds of questions about yeah. his hit tool. It even took him a couple of, of franchises to land in a spot where someone committed to give him that, that regular role. That happened in Baltimore, but he made quick stops in like San Diego and Oakland. And I think in both of those instances, we thought, oh, maybe this is the spot. Maybe this is the spot. So uh, it's funny that it ended up being Baltimore for Mateo. And even though like long, long term, it's not working out, he's... He landed in one of those organizations that we identified as good at developing hitting. Baltimore yeah. is in that conversation now for sure. Look at what they've been able to do in the upper levels of their system with the, the young talent they've had. The Rangers have become one of those teams with Donnie Ecker. Uh, the Giants do it a lot of times with veteran players turning some you know, kind of cast off waiver wire. Tyro Estrada types, Mike Yastrzemski types into good big leaguers. There's all different strengths and weaknesses in different organizations, but yes, there are definitely some teams that are better fits than others for unlocking what a, a hitter brings to the table. Couldn't you see him be an A, by the way? Couldn't you see Floreal just like <laughs> sign, get, get traded or sign with the Oakland A's and the, I could just, I Easily. see, and, and that wouldn't be good, by the way. That wouldn't no, be good that's at all. Not, I don't think that's the outcome you want. I mean, the park is difficult, but you can look at that team and say, like, how often do they make players better? Yeah, and it's, it's rare. I mean, you know, Geloff is a, 
is a fr fr uh, breath of fresh air right now with that team. But that really was just about his talent shining. I'm not sure what they've all really like honed in. Like Soderstrom is still kind of like the same guy he's been through the entire minors. You see the strikeout issues, but you see like huge, big power numbers. Yeah, it's going to take somebody to maybe revamp. Like one of the positives with Floreal this year, it's like the lowest ground ball. It's a gl lowest ground ball rate he has ever had between AAA and the majors. And I say it like that because since 2020, he has hovered between the majors and AAA that whole time. So you see the ground ball rate lowering and he's pulling the ball a little bit less. And maybe that's what it's going to be about is someone teaching him to maybe choke up a little bit more and stop trying to swing for the fences. And he'd be better set to be you know, a lower home run guy just so you can try to get on base. And, you know, who knows? But Mateo never figured out the strikeouts. Florial might never uh, figure out the strikeouts. That's also why, what did you say? It was like a 30 <laughs> hit present and future for fan yeah. graphs. It's because he's tapped out. That's That tells you from the prospect analysis standpoint, that is a player that is tapped out on their hit tool and it would take a miracle or take a massive change that we just haven't seen happen. I think it's 25 years old. You know, we haven't seen it happen in four or five years. So everyone's just assuming, okay, none of this other stuff matters anymore because this is at its peak and its maximum. Yeah, I think you, you could start to look around the league for other players that are in similar situations as far as like not really having a spot michael bush who you mentioned last week is one of them the problem is he has several options left the dodgers have yeah. that uh flexibility to just keep him around and use him as an up and down guy if they want to do that right so i think that's where as you start to look for other players that fit into the going to get a fresh opportunity bucket look at that number look at the number of minor league options remaining because when teams haven't given someone a chance and they don't have the opportunity to send them back down that's when they end up going through waivers or getting flipped in a minor trade. And that's usually when they end up finally ending up with a, a clear path to playing time. Uh, thanks a lot for that question, John. I had a question here from Abe. This is about uh, Royce Lewis's recent comments that the AAA robo umps were extremely hitter friendly, especially for walks. So Abe was wondering if we need to realign the data we're getting from the minors. Are there rate discrepancies notably different this year between AAA and the big leagues? This came up a little bit earlier in the year when we were looking at, I think it was J.J. Bladé, uh, just as one random example of someone whose plate skills looked a lot different. In the case of Bladé, it was that he was walking a little more um, compared to his like big league numbers and double-A numbers, but he started doing that last year at AAA. The big difference was he was striking out a lot less, a 12.6% K rate, and I wondered if we're if it's not just inflated walk rates, but also reduced K rates that we have to be on the lookout for as we're trying to make sense of some numbers coming out of AAA this year. That's interesting. It, it, it does, like, I don't I don't have the answer for that. I mean, I could, the recalibration could also be about how zones are, um, you know, how the strike zone is presented to a player. You know, you might just have guys and way that they stand in the box that, you know, typically uh, a, a real life ump is going to give them a little bit more leeway as far, or, or maybe less. So you could do all those things. But so I don't really have like a, a great answer to that outside of the continued conversation of what a mess the minor leagues is in my mind and how it's screwing up player development and every element, whether it is our own eyes or just reading off stats for minor league players. It's all a mess and it's mushed because of all of these different training systems of, you know, the, the ABS and the tacked ball and just all of this stuff that they're practicing and trying out in the minors. Good that you're doing it, but it just screws with our perception of development where, like you're saying, if it if you have a hitter friendly strike zone environment that hitters can figure out how to kind of manipulate exactly i mean if you know if you know exactly where the zone is without question you have a little bit of an advantage i think a hitter has an advantage on knowing that there's no leeway with the zone but just these tests just make it so crazy and it, it does come back to just trying to uh build off of the talent of a player and the skill sets that we know and not pick too hard apart a somebody that might struggle here or there or has you know like the andrew abbott stuff like 20k per nine with attacked ball and uh same thing with strikeout numbers maybe rising in those places with tacked balls and stuff like that it's it just the minor leagues are kind of a mess in general and it's it's screwing with things and it's it's good to know i think that would be the other thing it's really great to know 
all the places that are doing these things so we can put the caveats next to these players. But the only thing is, it's like, you know, it's not all of the double, it's not all of double A that had, um, you know, the tacked ball. It was like, what was it? Like the independent league. The Southern it, league, yeah. Or the Southern league, yeah, exactly. Like it would be great if, you know, it was more widespread so we didn't have to try to play these games of figuring out, so who's doing this and where is this at? And it's just, I hate the mess of it. I don't, I don't personally like it. I think generally, and this frustrates me across other sports, the rules, once you get to the college level and in baseball and the minor league level, should be the same. This, the rules yeah. should be the same. The equipment should be the same. You need to standardize things at some point. I realize prior to a certain level, cost is a factor, and you can't make everything one-to-one -one in terms of how the game is going to be played from a very technical perspective, but using the minor leagues as an ongoing experiment is not a good idea, right? It Especially gets... at the higher levels. Like, you have the AFL. The AFL has been trying out stuff for years. Mm -hmm. Cool. Keep doing that. Keep it there. But if if I were to lay out the minor league system, here's a major league team, DVR. They have AAA, which is the closest to the majors. AA, which we could pick major league talent, biggest developmental push. High A, which is the biggest jump probably of any level from low A to high is the biggest jump. Then we've got low A and we've got complex rookie ball, the lowest level. What in your mind would be the best place to experiment out of those? Would <laughs> it be the, the one, yeah. the lowest, of course, Easily. like not the highest, the guys that are just about to be at the majors that are making adjustments. You might have guys that are trying to change from being high contact hitters to uh, ha developing more power. You might have a pitcher that's trying to really establish now more of this breaking pitch or what the lowest levels, the complex level. Yes, it's big guys come but guys that are just coming in from the, the the dominican or coming in from high school or whatnot or you get these college guys that come in for three four days let that be the experimental spot not when they're at the most critical points of their development to make the major leagues that would not be the place that i would be having major ex those type of experiments like what bryce miller had to do when he told eno about you know, the team just saying, we just want you to just throw strikes. Like, don't worry about hitting the zone. Just throw pump strikes and stuff. Okay, that's an organizational thing. You can get past that. But tacked balls and robo umps and uh, all of this stuff, uh, you know, automatic strikes, all of these things, do that at the lowest level. Experiment. Have your fun there. Don't do it at the expense of these guys. I don't know if we have, like, a great track record of players that are suffering from this. But it's maybe creating some, you know, some false, uh, false positives with players. Uh, luckily, Royce Lewis is massively talented, by the way. And it doesn't <laughs> matter if he's getting a little bit of an advantage there. But it'd just be nice if it was, if, they, if, it, if there's more of a, a rhyme and reason to how they're doing this instead of being like, let's go to the Southern League and let's go to AAA and let's go to AA and let's do a little bit of here, a little bit of there. Yeah, and I, I did think just to put a bow on it from the, the robo -ums perspective, like seeing higher walk rates from guys that are repeating that level, that would be something I'd be a little more skeptical of. Jonathan Aranda, been uh, featured throughout the episode, is a good example of that, right? 9.7% walk rate a year ago at AAA. That's fine. It's a good walk rate. 14.7% this year. Yeah, did he really point. improve by that much, or is that just the function of the system? I bet you'd see in players repeating the level, if I had to put a hypothesis out there, I bet you'd see two and a half to three percentage points up for walk rates for hitters repeating that level over substantial sample sizes. And that's probably or more. two to three percentage higher than what the normal rate is. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a, you know, it, it's probably a one for one of like that is an abnormal increased rate. Um, again, it's just I don't know. It's kind of silly to me. Yeah, definitely silly to me, too. Thanks a lot for that question, Abe. Uh, we covered a lot of ground today. And uh, we made it through a, a minor tantrum from my young son, too. So I appreciate Welsh's patience and flexibility as we work through a new and exciting stage of parenting in the Van Riper household. Oh, you're not even, uh, you're just getting there. I told it's, you, I was like, I've, I've, I've been through all of them. I've been through all of them twice. So I know the the stages and don't you worry. There's it takes also, a village DVR. It does. And our, our village is, is out working on uh, something for themselves today, this morning. So the, the backup help that's usually here when I record <laughs> wasn't available. So I was 
I was the backup help, but uh, $1 a month gets you in the door at The Athletic. Great subscription offer we got going right now. It's for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. You can find Welsh on X, not the drug, the yeah. social media platform at Is It The Welsh. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Wednesday.